Dear Father, you are good. Lord, I put a lot of work into this, but God, it's just you who speaks. I love what Pastor Clifford says. Uh, um, is this what's going through my head the last two and a half months? Is that, Lord, it's you be glory. May I be an instrument for you to work. I can do nothing on my own, but with you I can do anything. Everything is possible. So speak through me. Most of all, teach me something as I try to convey what you guys have in my heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, as you're probably in Deuteronomy right now, um, the main passage right now is going to be actually Proverbs 14, 23, but it's short enough that you'll need to go there. Um, I can say it from memory. And the main passage and what it says is that work brings profit, but mere talk leads to poverty. And that's New Living Translation. And God kind of took my heart in this and I was wondering, and as I chewed over it, I remember a story that I come from my own life, and it's quite a routine life. If you don't know, I live in a house, I live in a room, and I have clothes that I um, sometimes do not put up right. And especially when before bed, I would rather just throw on the floor, deal with it tomorrow, or deal with it a week later. But when this passage, when this passage of scripture spoke to me, I was like. Work brings profit, but mere taught leads to poverty. I thought of how often I step over said clothes as I go in my room, as I get out in the living room, whatever. It drives my mom insane. So I'm sorry, mom. I'll look directly on the camera on that one. But I walk over it, and every time there's a little voice in my head that says, I should pick that up. I should pick that up. You know, it'll be about 50 or 60 times I say that, and I'm wondering, you know, my mom, I wonder what mom's thinking, what my dad's thinking. My dad's more okay with it. But in terms of, and then a week later, I finally do the set task for leaving my room. Especially as a college student, you always have a destination in mind. And so I do that. But what I want to relay that back to the spiritual nature is that God, in a lot of, a lot of this, wants us to put a work on our faith. And that's where I want to go with this. And so when I look at what Moses said in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, it's in verse 12, it offers a perfect blueprint for how we do this. And he's talking to the Israelite people about wholehearted commitment. And so read along with me, I'm going to read verse 4, this will be the New Living Translation. We're going to look at it in the ESV shortly. But it says, Listen to Israel. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road. When you're going to bed and when you're getting up, tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as a reminder. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And then in verse 12, he kind of shares a reason. Why do we do this? We do this because we be careful not to forget the Lord who rescued you from old slavery in the land of Egypt. All throughout Deuteronomy, there is a history lesson in every page of Deuteronomy. If you go and you probably count at least I went through the first three chapters and tried in vain to count how many times he said, either remember this, don't forget this, and whatever, and whatever, what have you, in different ways he said it. And that kind of stuck to me. And I want to kind of give you a sticky statement. This is what my old youth pastor would say, but this is the main message of what I have to teach. And it's, it's I want this to stick in your mind. It's the sticky part. And if you don't remember anything that I say, I hope you remember this sentence, that God desires relationship with you, but that relationship requires wholehearted commitment that's fulfilled through action. And let's personalize, personalize a little bit. 
Let's talk between you and God. God desires a relationship with me, but it requires wholehearted commitment that's fulfilled through my actions. And that's what God was leading me to. And I want to look to verse 6, and I actually forgot to get my ESV Bible, but I can go off of memory. And look at verse 6 for me. You might have this uh, very similar. It says, I'm commanding you, I mean, and these commands shall be on your heart, and these commands shall be on your heart. There's two Hebrew words that comprise a sentence, and one of them is sabah, T-S-A-B-A-H. And the second part of it is labab, L-E-B-A-B. Zabab simply means to lay charge, to order. I think of Moses in this moment kind of commanding his inner, inner general, commanding you, and shall be on your heart. It means inner man and a woman, mind and heart, in your heart. So this was not an option for Moses. This is not an option for the people of Israel. He's seen them as they've been rebellious. He's seen them as they've fallen into idolatry. And so that's what we look to. And so I wanted to look and examine several other scriptures that kind of track the history of said commitment that the Israelites were to have. And if you turn your Bibles with me, turn to Joshua 21. Moses is long gone at this point. In fact, Joshua is soon to be as well. But the famous, uh, sorry, 24, Joshua 24, my bad. And we know that the verse 15 is a famous verse. I mean, it's, you know, what um, we say was, was on those rules of duct tape, that's for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. But in that, he asked the Israelites. And he asked several questions. He was wondering, why in the world would you want to be committed to the Lord? When you're rebellious, these things I've been saying before, when you're rebellious, when you fall into idolatry very quickly, and when you obviously can't keep your word. And he asked this question to all the Israelites, but the Israelites say this. They say, no, we'll serve the Lord after a long um, couple sentences of, of words that Joshua shares in this in the, uh, brief history. He says, Joshua would continue to say, He's, God is a holy and jealous God. And I love verse 22, and it says, You are a witness to your own decision, Joshua said, and you have chosen to serve the Lord. So they chose. They chose to be committed to the Lord. And they actually did well for a little bit. But let's look 330 years in the future at Joshua 21. In Joshua 21, we look at, um, we come through, if you've read, or read this book, I'm sure most of you have, is that it's filled with depravity. The Israelites quickly and succinctly fall away from the Lord. There's a few bright moments with some of the various judges, I mean Deborah, uh, Samson, obviously Gideon, and that may last a generation or two. But look at the last verse. The last verse of ch uh, chapter 21 in Judges says, In those days Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their eyes, in their own eyes. And I can't help but, when I think of my own history, how similar I am. How I try to be wholeheartedly committed to the Lord and fall so quickly. And it's so easy as we read the scripture, and as I, um, most of this I've been in the chronological study of the Bible, and I've enjoyed that. But what I've realized is that, you know, we can point our fingers at the Israelites and say, how can you do this? You've seen God split the seas twice. You've seen God split, uh, you split open a rock twice. And the second time would cost 40 years in the desert. You've seen manna come down from heaven. You've seen pheasants populate. And obviously God was kind of sarcastic, I would think, in doing that one. But God has provided every turn. And how dare you not be committed to the Lord? And I point my finger sometimes at them. I wonder, how dare you? But just as I said before, we're the Israelites. How often do we go in our daily lives? And I notice to my chagrin and to my dismay that oftentimes, how often do I pray to the Lord? How often do I read the word with enjoyment, knowing the lessons that are about to be unfolded? 
And just as we looked at verse 6, what uh, Moses said was that it was not an option to read the scriptures. And you look up at, I believe it's in Deuteronomy 18, the king himself would have a, a separate scroll for the law for him to read. That's how important it is to us. And so this is our story. But luckily, it's not the end of our story. It's not the end of our story. And so I want to go and take this remaining time and kind of go to what can we do? What can we do? In terms of our relationship with God, we are familiar with how the Bible is the main way we communicate with Him. This, and this in turn affects our prayer life. If we don't know the Bible, how do we know to pray? Just as Kyle Rody has discussed in our Sunday School for Young Adults. And so when we look at the Bible, how do we read it? And one big thing that came out to me as I was reading Rick Warren's book on how to study the Bible, it was all about application. He writes in the preface of the book, he says, the ultimate goal of any Bible study is application, not interpretation. Because God wants to change your life. If you know what to do in your mind, it's okay. But why did Moses decide to use that word the Bob? It's because it should be deeper than that. It should fill your entire being. It should be in the inner sanctum of where you allow us to change your life. And so when I looked at this, I kind of um, coined this term, and it's on the flip side of this, and how we do apply the Bible, I call it the faithfuls. I call it the faithfuls. That's why I titled this section. And we know that God wants a relationship with us, that he wants us to be committed to him, and that he wants us to act it out. But how has God been faithful to us? When we read the Bible, we see in multiple ways of how God has been faithful to us. And so if you want to flip over to Psalm 78, we're going to look at um, a couple verses over there. Uh, we'll look at verses 1 through 3 and verse 8. But I'm so excited about this one because um, it really... And by the way, all these scriptures I came across in my daily Bible reading, none of this, and God really laid this on my heart, as Pastor Clifford said. Well, let's look at like verses 1 through 3, and then look at verses 7 and 8. And so I'll read it once again, if you want to follow along. Oh, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I'm saying, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past, stories we've heard and known, Stories our ancestors handed down to us. And then flip to verse 7. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Then they will not be like their ancestors. They, then they will not be like their ancestors. Stubborn, rebellious, unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. That's really the message of the Bible in a nutshell. Especially the Old Testament. My goodness. How many times have Moses, Joshua, Gideon, every single one of the judges, I believe, quoted some part of Israel's history back to the people to remind them. And this is written by the prophet Asaph, the worship leader, and I can't help but think that our paths are our books to be read, to be applied when we read the Bible. And I have done that frequently as I remember God's commitment to me and how he has been faithful. God has been faithful. And that's the section that we're focusing on now. The 13 Psalms before, in Psalms, sorry, 15 Psalms before, in Psalm 63, we read how God is faithful. We're switching to the present now. God is faithful. We're going to read through verses 1 through 5. Sorry, verse 1. Oh God, listen to my complaint. Nope, that's not one. That's one verse. Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirst for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. I have seen in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. And what David is going through right now is he's on the run from King Saul. And I love, my Bible has a picture of what it kind of depicts in, in um, chapter 63. And he's stuck between two carved mountain ranges, really. They look like mountain ranges. To your side of them, there's plenty of water, but where he is right now, there is none. And what wonderful thing about David is David is never far away from hitting his knees. 
he uses his, this is where the physical meets the spiritual. And he uses his physical needs to fuel his devotion to the Lord. He's known God has been faithful to him. He knows he will be faithful. And I love the words he uses. And I love David himself. He's one of my favorite characters in the Bible. Characters. People in the Bible. Of which he traces his life throughout Psalms. He's never quick. Never too quick. Never too late. To hit his knees. And raise his hands and say, Lord, I am in despair. I am in praise. And everything in between. And that's what I love about David. David is a perfect picture of how God is faithful. And then finally, we have God will be faithful. God will be faithful. One of the great things I love about Young Adult Ministry is that we've chosen a particular verse that I've memorized and, and absolutely love, and it's Jeremiah 29, 11. And I have this shirt right here to give you a depiction of how important it is to our ministry that it's quoted directly on the back of the shirt. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for good and not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. Awesome words. And if you don't know the history of those, ver uh, those words, is that Jeremiah is writing to um, desolate, destroyed Jerusalem. He's writing to, in this, in this particular section of Scripture, to um, people who were exiled in Babylon. The city, the city on the hill, the city of all their hopes lay on, has been utterly destroyed. Jeremiah has never had a single one of his teachings heeded. Hmm. Imagine that. Imagine that. You're in, that. you're in that situation. And he's alone with the outcast of those who, honestly, are not worthy to travel to Babylon, who cannot make the journey. And imagine him, I believe he's on his knees or somewhere, crying and weeping when he's when he's writing this and saying 70 years you'll spend in Babylon but believe me the prosperity we have experienced in this wonderful city will once again be rebuilt and once again be enjoyed and that's awesome that's really is awesome now I think of two stories that came to me as I um, as number one I got this in the mail but um, in my own life, how this has been a quickly apparent to me is that I have anemia. And I don't know, most of you might not know what that's like. But it basically, it saps every bit of energy out of you. It is slow and agonizing. And I'm having my iron infusions over five parts this week. I had one this morning. And what has been apparent to me is that I have been angry and frustrated with God. But I've seen how God has been faithful in this time. Sports was taken away from me. I never thought I'd play sports ever again. I couldn't run out of basketball court. How in the world would I be able to play sports? Well, I came into Lane via the sports ministry, so I say that's pretty good. But as well as whenever I go into an iron infusion, I always remember the past memories, how I struggled with it in high school, how I struggled with it when I was in, kind of in my 20s as I graduated high school. And how God has been faithful to me to show me lessons I would never have learned if I had not gone through painful times. And then, to, to make things even better, is that um, the university that I chose to go to, the only one I applied to in high school, Rollins College, I decided to transfer in 2021. I thought I was going to finish my four years there. I was, my heart was set on it. But God said no. He says you need to move. And so my family and I didn't know what was going to happen. You're we like, good night, what can we do? And so I transferred to Valencia. And that's how literally I said it. I said Valencia. <laughs> I had a Cadillac of education, now I'm going to Valencia. <laughs> but that's how I felt. I know. I'm sorry, Jim. But in terms of that's how I felt. It's like God, you're pulling you're the rug out of them. But then I spent a year at Valencia, and God humbled me, as he, as he had to. And I recently got this in the mail. And if you don't know what it is, is that I've been accepted to the University of Florida. And I've been online, so I'll stay in the area. I love this church, so I wanted to find an online university. But this reminded me, is that God is faithful. 
And I did not know when I transferred from Rollins that I would be at the University of Florida. I had no idea where I was going. But God was faithful. I knew that, even though I didn't know two steps in front of me. And God never promised that. The final story I want to share with you is um, from a member of our previous church. His name is Danny Haddad. And his family really had an impact on ours. Danny Haddad was diagnosed with ALS in 2018. And unfortunately, he passed away in April, this past April. And we went to the Celebration of Life ceremony and we heard great stories. I love hearing the stories of him. And even though it was sad, the man was full of commitment to God. And his dad was telling the story. He was telling the story back when in 2018 when he was diagnosed. He took Danny on a car ride. And he was, Danny couldn't imagine what was going through his head. And, he had, and his dad said, it's like a truth serum to his children. So he took him on a car ride, talked for three or four hours about this. Probably every topic under the sun dealing with the ALS and the uncertainty of it. But he asked this monumental question to his dad. Something that I don't know if I would have the courage to ask. He said, Dad, I know the Lord is good. I know God is good. But when I reach my time, is he still good? Will he still be good? And four years later, <laughs> I chuckled at the thought because Danny had, Danny's father, being human, didn't know when the Lord was going to take him. He asked him three times before he passed away. Is the Lord good? And at each time, they said, yes, he's still good. And you should have seen Danny. Danny was still worshiping on stage year two around or, or something like that when we're, when we're um, still at Discovery Church, and we're, we're so excited to see him, and he's such an inspiration. But he's decided to change his life because he knew God had been faithful to him, and he wanted to return the favor. He wanted to return the favor to his family, to his wife and four kids. Am I right, Doug? Yes, four kids, all under age of 10. You can imagine. All under age of 10. But one thing I loved at the end of this is that we heard from Danny, that from his, from his family, that five people came to know Christ through Danny's story. Yeah. Five. That's awesome. But right afterwards, when the pastor of the, of the church, we, we had the celebration of life ceremony, he said, he has that, had an altar call, figured out the altar call. And he said, five more came to know Christ at that celebration of life. That is the answer to prayer. That is awesome. But what was so cool about this is that it illustrates perfectly Proverbs 14, 23, is that when we put the work in, when we're committed to the Lord, God not only returns to what was given to you, he yields a prophet. He yields a prophet to you. And he'll bless you in so many ways as I've seen in my own life. And so that's my lesson. And there's one thing as I was reading and finishing up Christianity, it's not going to be easy to do this. It's a whole hard commitment. It's hard to be committed each day. Because what St. C.S. Lewis and I took from him is that we're going to be transformed from ten soldiers without a heart made in the image of God, even though we might not know it or may not acknowledge it, to sons of God. A very transformation. And last, the last Bible verse is going to be in Second Chronicles 15, 15. And I just read this a couple days ago. Thank the Lord. Is that um, it's right around uh, King, King Asa. King Asa was, was, was um, ruling. And this is the result of a good committed relationship, a committed a covenant to the Lord. All in Judah were happy about this covenant. For they had entered into it with all their heart. They earnestly sought after God and they found him. And the Lord gave the rest, gave them rest from their enemies on every side. And that's what the Lord will do for us. And so thank you for listening. Thank you for um, hearing my heart as I really went through this. I hope you do apply God's word. And that lastly, you know that God wants a relationship with you. And that again, he's been faithful to us. So we need to be faithful to him. And we need to show it through our very lives. So thank you.